The biggest problem with wrapped assets is that signature check. The best way we thought to completely secure is to get rid of it. DeFi gave me and my family like economic opportunities that we wouldn't have otherwise have had. Junior year paid for all of my rent using Litecoin mining. Relax, Tim, Space Monkeys blasting off with Harrison and Noah, the damn fine guys from Damn Finance, and very happy to have them on the show because they are working on some projects, some products that this ecosystem desperately needs. Guys, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, it's a pleasure. So you guys kind of came up out of nowhere, Damn Finance. Uh, where'd you get the name? Well, the first requirement was we wanted to have a name that could be said in any language. Yeah. So we thought, damn, <laughs> fit that bill. Nice, yeah. And we really like the water theme. So we felt like, mm. given we're a DeFi protocol all around scaling native liquidity, the mm. dam is a pretty good symbol yeah. for that type of uh, mission statement. Very good. And um, you guys have been in DeFi for a while, as I understand it. Maybe a quick overview of uh, your first touch with DeFi and how it changed your life and made you dedicate all your time to, to building something cool. So I've actually been in uh, crypto for, for a minute. Um, my first start was at uh, Boston College where I founded the BC Crypto Club. And then uh, that was around 2017-ish when Bitcoin first hit 20K. Mm -hmm. So junior year, um, I actually paid for all of my rent using Litecoin mining. Really? So, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> so, pre pre DeFi, I was already, you know, using using uh the coins to kind of get the job done. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> wow, amazing. Yeah. What did the what did the mining rig look like at that time? Um it it was a pretty sure it was Bitmain. I think they're still around like ant miners sort of stuff. It was one of their like first Litecoin mining machines. That's why I hopped on it. Yeah. Is cuz I knew that it would uh kind of explode the the proof of work, uh, terahash per second, you know, sort of thing. Crazy. Yeah, at the time. So, you know, Bitcoin was being just decimated by new miner after new miner about every two months. And I wanted the investment to last a little bit longer, so I chose Litecoin. Okay, nice. Yeah. Great. Okay, how about you, Harrison? What happened? So, I uh, started my journey in the blockchain world in late 2015. Mm -hmm. I joined a company called R3 as one of its first employees, and they were building a a blockchain for banks. Um, mm. So fast forward a few years, by 2019, you know, a lot of the projects that we were working on got stuck in innovation purgatory, mm. and they weren't really progressing. And when I started to sort of look at all the innovation that was happening in the public space, I knew for sure that was where I wanted to be. So I left R3 on a full-time basis and just started exploring uh, other ecosystems. And one of the first light papers that I read was the Polkadot one. Really? And I was immediately attracted to it because the notion of like a parachain while having a shared consensus service across all of the of the parachains mm -hmm. uh, or business networks mm -hmm. uh, was very much in line with a lot of the enterprise requirements that we had learned about from R3, especially with regards to being able to have autonomy over governance, upgrades, things of that nature. So that was a meet, that was something that was on our radar really early in terms of an ecosystem. And then for uh, a couple of years, pretty much earned my living off of uh, yield farming and, and airdrops. Crazy. Um, and you know, I uh, wanted to get an apartment for, for my family. Um, so I tried to go to the bank and explain how I was earning my income. And as you can imagine, uh, <laughs> when I was explaining, trying to explain what pancake swap was, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, uh, it was, uh, I was met with some, some questionable stares. So I really, you know, in terms of learning about the different DeFi primitives, actually was able to buy an apartment. Um, using some of the uh, over collateralized uh, stablecoin protocols on Ethereum. Wow. Um, and the coolest part uh, was um, so, yeah, so I actually used MIM, Magic Internet Money. Right. Um, and that experience really kind of informed a lot of our product roadmap, actually. Mm. Um, swapped the MIM to USDC, converted the USDC to fiat. Uh, then, on paper, from the perspective of the person that we bought the place from, um, bought it 100% cash. Um, Direct so from the from the owner. From, well, yeah, exactly. Like from his perspective, it was just a straight cash purchase, even though it was actually financed through debt and uh, through through crypto. Yeah. Um, and then at that point, we went to the bank and were able to get a loan 
Against the house. Against the house, like from an LTV perspective. Perfect, perfect. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so it was, uh, so that was like a really kind of, wow. Yeah, that was, so ever, basically the punchline was it. DeFi gave me and my family like economic opportunities that we wouldn't have otherwise have had. So yeah. that's always been why I've been so passionate about the DeFi space because, you know, it's it's a, an alternative route um, for many different kind of economic opportunities for folks. You do not hear a story like that about DeFi every day. <laughs> You're one of the winners, eh? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think what's really cool about like a lot of some of these communities is that they really encourage um, new participants. Yep. So, you know, like some of the, the nicest people that, that like I've come across in the space are like the support channels on Discord from these different projects. Hmm. And I think having that kind of consumer or user empathy is really important. No doubt. So we have um, head of engineering, yes. right? And product head. And have you guys built, a, built something before? Uh, definitely not uh, stable coin focused before. Okay. Um, so my kind of path after college was, you know, middle crypto winter, mm. looking for a job. And I knew that Fidelity was still close to crypto while also being a very stable Web2 company. Yeah. So I went for asset management that route, kept my finger on the pulse, um, and it was high net worth uh multi-asset optimizations of their portfolio, basically. That was their service. Uh, built that out, and then last bull run, uh, finally got rid of Fidelity, decided we're doing this thing, Yeah. got into crypto. Um, I worked at Miria, which is an NFT exchange layer two. Mm -hmm. Not super massive yet, but competitor to Mutable X for uh, like five, six months. And then we founded Dam. Great stuff. And yeah. how, about, how about you, Harrison? So I started my career in, in leverage finance uh, at uh, Bank of America, although at the time I used to call it Bank of Opportunity. <laughs> then uh, after that, I uh, had the opportunity to work in private equity at Oak Hill Capital Partners. I was tasked with looking after their aerospace portfolio. And sort of my flagship deal was the securitization of four Boeing 777F aircraft that all had different tranches of debt with these German banks, and there was a 10-year uh, rental agreement from Deutsche Post, which was where the income was coming from. Ooh. And that ended up gets, getting sold, those four planes, to the Korean National Pension Service. But as you can imagine, being low man on the totem pole on the deal team, I was constantly reconciling Excel spreadsheets, having to send things to, to lawyers, and having discrepancies around amortization payments and things of that nature. And then I learned what like blockchain was. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking to myself, wow, I mean, if all of this data was on a blockchain, I wouldn't have to be doing any of this, these, you know, really painful reconciliation. So yeah. um, I had the opportunity to join R3 uh, as, as one of its first employees. And um, while I was there, I, I got increasingly closer to the technology. So as the Corda platform was being developed, there was an enterprise version that was created. Mm -hmm. So I had the opportunity to work on it directly with some of the, the fintechs that were using the Corda platform, you know, businesses like WorldPay and Finastra and that nature, and really understood kind of like what the requirements that they had with regards to deploying blockchain systems. Mm -hmm. And in terms of a business development perspective, um, I, uh, I studied Arabic in university. So um, mm -hmm. when R3 was looking to expand in the Middle East, I uh, had the opportunity to kind of start up the Middle Eastern franchise. And as you can imagine, um, when I needed a pre-sales person to come with me, uh, you know, if, 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 I was, if I was trying to convince them to come with me in Riyadh um, or Abu Dhabi, I didn't always win that argument when their alternative was to go to London or to Paris. Right. Um, okay. So I had to really understand how to like sell a, court, a platform to or explain a platform to developers. So I just really realized that in order to make the most of the space, it really requires you to just have as good of a technical understanding of, of the project as possible. And, you know, I sort of talked about the, you know, the, my journey in DeFi and so forth, but where kind of this all started was in connection with borrowing against crypto assets, you know, we talked about the DeFi experience, mm -hmm. but actually the process of using the single asset stable coin borrowing protocols to buy the apartment in terms of managing the volatility, mm -hmm. it was horrible. Mm. It was just so capital inefficient because first and foremost, a lot of those protocols, they don't give you credit for the overall amount of assets that you deposit into the platform. Right. So like you could have two single asset vaults. One is 
significantly over collateralized. But if the other if the other asset isn't, then you can get liquidated and lose your assets. Yeah. So I had a Christmas uh, evening ruined uh, due to some of those, the volatility and the, the sushi price. Oh, really? <laughs> associated with that. Oh, man. Um, but, okay. But the other aspect of that was at the time, you know, I was I personally was holding assets in the, in the polka dot in the Kusama ecosystem. And it was a really big bummer that I wasn't able to borrow against those assets. Yeah. Um, well, we've been waiting for products just like the ones you guys are building. And let's take a look at them. But um, we have a big one that uh, I think has just recently been announced. Um, but let's talk about the D2O first, because I think that's that's a really unique concept as well. Uh, how do you describe the D2O concept to other people? So we think of D2O as something that is 10 times better than a wrapped stablecoin asset. So the way that it works is that it's minted one for one uh, on the Ethereum blockchain with USDC. Mm -hmm. And then the idea or goal of D2O is to be a primitive that can be used to help increase or help scale native stablecoin liquidity on non-Ethereum blockchains. So we essentially enabled an ability to teleport D2O from Ethereum to uh, the Polkadot ecosystem, initially on Moonbeam through a mint and burn fault tolerant architecture. So what we basically did was as a team is like we studied all of the hacks that have happened in connection with, uh, you know, bridging wrapped assets cross network. And we attempted to address them in connection with the way that D2O moves from one network to another. To another. Okay, so I lock up some USDC on Ethereum, and then it gets minted on Moonbeam to start. So there's a so the workflow is you, yeah. you take your USDC, you deposit it on Ethereum, and you get D2O. Mm -hmm. Then in order to get D2O or move it as a native asset to Moonbeam, there's three steps. The first thing that needs to happen is that your balance of D2O needs to be burned on Ethereum. Because it's the it's sort the works sort of like an accounting adjustment in the protocol. Mm -hmm. So then, once you burn your D two O on uh, on Ethereum, evidence of that needs to be sent to the Moonbeam blockchain. Essentially, okay. Evidence of that is passed through a primitive that we call that we built called the Reservoir. Really like the water theme, mm -hmm. and that sits on top of cross chain messaging protocols such as Layer Zero and Hyperlane. And one of the reasons why we support multiple cross-chain messaging protocols is because of resilience. Right. So kind if, of, if one goes down, you have another path. Yeah, exactly. It's okay. really inspired by like the high availability and disaster recovery architecture that we see in like enterprise type of IT setups. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the destination network, the D2O is then minted as a native asset. It's not like wrapped D2O. It's 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 the sort of same D2O wherever any network that it gets teleported to. And then on top of that. We built something called the Guardian, which is essentially a DAP that's running on both blockchains. That's just essentially mapping every mint and burn together. Because okay. if you have a mint that happens on the Moonbeam blockchain, by definition, there should have been a burn on the Ethereum blockchain. Yep. So we have a DAP that's essentially just matching up to make sure that all of the mints and burns are sort of adding up from a ledger perspective. What's so novel about this concept and why, why aren't other people using it? The biggest problem with wrapped assets is usually that signature check that says, does this asset exist on the source chain? That's where uh, like Nomad, for example, um, kind of blew up is that signature check. If you passed in nothing, it said, yep, that's verified. Okay, you can take out all these assets. So kind of the best way we thought to make that completely, um, completely secure is to get rid of it entirely. Uh, so <laughs> we've kind of decoupled the decoupled that process of wrapping. And, and so USDC is locked up and it's a wholly different process than the moving of D2O right. to another chain. Okay. I mean, we've been paying attention. So I think that's why we're kind of early to it. Nice. But yeah, it's not, I think most people just use kind of whatever's there rather than thinking about it. And that's what we've got to, we've got this product up and running now. And to be fair, mm -hmm. part of what make it, makes it possible is the prevalence of these cross chain messaging protocols. Right. Yeah. So that really helps. And you know, back in sort of more enterprise days, we had the opportunity to work on a number of the central bank digital currency pilots. Mm -hmm. So this fault tolerant architecture that sort of thinks about where are the vulnerabilities across multiple layers of the actual minting and teleportation is largely inspired by the work that we did in connection with trying to make the CBDC of one sovereignty you know, teleport to the soft to like the blockchain, for lack of a better term, of like another you know sovereign central bank. Sure. Wow. Okay. 
Um, and um, you guys are deploying on Ethereum and Moonbeam right now. Are there plans to deploy on other in other EVM environments as well? So in connection with EVM, uh, we will be deploying on a star. Nice. But our roadmap as it relates to D2O yeah. is to uh, create as much utility for it initially in the Polkadot ecosystem as possible. Right. Um, so, you know, we, we really want to be part of being, you know, bringing in that new liquidity yep. um, that is scalable and, and, you know, in our opinion, offers a better user experience um, uh, than potentially some alternatives and really drive as much composability as possible. And for us, you know, Polkadot is, is, our, is our destination in that regard. Excellent. So that's uh, D2O is bringing liquidity in from outside the ecosystem and making it usable inside the ecosystem. That's, that's yes. the focus on the roadmap there. Exactly. Okay. And now you guys also have another product, which is to turn a lot of the liquidity already inside the ecosystem into useful assets for DeFi activities. Um, what do you want to tell us about that? Uh, Harrison, uh, so, nice to see you here. I, I, I don't know what happened there. That guy just got the, the pie in the face. You know, it happens to the best of us. Right, right, right. Well, uh, it, it, it's really too bad because we recorded that episode several weeks ago and we were having this amazing conversation that everybody just saw. And then we got to the point where we were talking about a new project that you were working on that was going to make use of the liquidity already in the ecosystem. It was a project that I was really excited about. It was going to give utility to DOT. And then um, the project, unfortunately, didn't make it through um, certain red tape in the Polkadot ecosystem, I guess. It, you know, timing is everything. And sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, you, you have an idea that, that, that makes sense and feels like you have some momentum uh, around it, but sometimes things outside of your control make it such that the timing just isn't correct. Okay, that's a good way to put it. That's a good way to put it. Well, it's um, a loss in my eyes, and, and hopefully the timing will be better in the future there. Um, because it has been a few weeks, though, uh, D2O has been live on Moonbeam for quite a long time. Uh, how have you been finding the rollout of that product and its use cases? Has it uh, met your expectations? In many regards, we're really proud of what we've accomplished with D2O. Uh, it's one of the most actively used and widely held assets on Moonbeam. Uh, as a native stablecoin, there's a ton of different forms of utility. Um, it's currently accepted as collateral on lending and borrowing protocols. You have it such that you can rent NFTs using D2O. Um, it's one of the most actively traded pairs in terms of markets against Glimmer. We want a grant from the Moonbeam Foundation. We're going to be setting up a D2O XE dot uh, pair. Uh, you can invoice now using request finance using D2O. And uh, there are a couple of projects that are in the process of converting part of their on-chain treasury to D2O as well. So in many regards, we're extremely happy with the partnerships that we've been striking um, and a lot of the utility that we've been able to generate for D2O. That's great. Um, has uh, anything happened that you didn't expect? Yeah, I I think that, and I'm sure a lot of DeFi founders out there can relate to this. It's really tough right now. There's a lot of risk aversion in this space. Yeah. You know, you read about, you know, a lot of these unfortunate contract vulnerabilities that get exploited. And even if they're not exploited, it's almost if some news outlets, you know, like to sensationalize the sort of outcomes associated with them. And it, it scares people. You know, it scares people from trying uh, experimentation with new DeFi products and things of that nature. So I think that going back to the, the concept around timing, timing being really key, you know, I'm not sure that the timing and at, as we speak right now, and it changes very quick in this space, is, is necessarily the best for new DeFi projects. Uh, you also have this like regulatory backdrop, which, yeah. you know, increasingly gets more and more, uh, I would say, aggressive by the day. You know, you, you kind of marry those two things together. And also the fact that, you know, a lot of the sort of crypto casual folks, you know, they, they, they've moved on to other things for the, for the time being. So sort of like the audience that you're speaking to feels a bit smaller these days. It's just I think the timing is tough right now relative to what it was, uh, you know, certainly 18 months ago, a year ago. Yeah, no doubt. How has your strategy changed in response to this environment? I think the first thing that we're really focused on is having empathy, you know, because mm. 
you know, very often you, you, you could be speaking to someone who's, you know, lost money or participated in, in, in one of these projects that has had a kind of one of these unfortunate outcomes. Uh, so I think that having empathy is really key. Um, you know, in our community, we're fortunate to have a few really active participants. And rather than saying, oh, well, you know, you only have this many members in your Discord or, you know, oh, like, you know, your Discord or your TG isn't growing, you know. We rather say, hey, look, we've got this number of people who are very active and we rather focus on the fact that we have active users, that we have projects integrating D2O, kind of being happy for what we've been able to accomplish and really just nurture those relationships because the reality is that things will turn around if history tells us anything. And, you know, I think now is the time to be really striking up relationships because when everything you know, starts going gangbusters again, I think people will probably be more inclined to respond to and, and, and partner and work with some of the folks that were around when, you know, <laughs> there wasn't a bunch of champagne being popped, so to speak. That's right. It's a really nice time to build some relationships based on loyalty here. I think it's also a really good time to, to be honest with yourself. You know, hmm. is this, is, is what I'm working on something that is compelling? right? Is it right. compelling in a bear market, right? And I think that some of the product work that we've been able to do in terms of really getting the opportunity to speak to customers and understand how exactly they're feeling, what their preferences are, how they'd like to experiment with things. You have really the opportunity to have a level of detailed conversation that you wouldn't ordinarily otherwise have. In many ways, there's um, some really you know tremendous product work that you can do because folks are more accessible. They're willing to have conversations, and you know you can you can design something that that in, it really kind of is two, three, four, five levels ahead in terms of addressing a potential customer's needs. That's right. So, are you guys trying to expand your user base at all? Is D2O going to other EVM chains yet? So we've deployed on a star, and something that we're really excited about is we enabled the functionality to essentially teleport D2O to any EVM-based network um, in a matter of a few days. And we were able to do that in connection with Hyperlane. Um, we worked very closely with them and, and, and we worked closely with the Astar team on that. Um, so, you know, we are excited to be having the opportunity to increase the utility for D2O uh, in the Astar ecosystem. All right, beautiful. And uh, with that other project we spoke about previously now on the shelf, uh, what have you and your team been working on? Is there anything besides D2O in the works? Absolutely, there is. And I think that in connection with a lot of the soul searching that we've been doing as a project, we've had to look ourselves in the mirror and say, is D2O a killer dap? While I think that we introduce some amazing cross-chain innovation in terms of how you move uh, a token from one network to another, I also think that we were a very big part of you know this anti-wrapped token narrative. You'll notice there's a lot of shame in terms of admitting utilization of wrapped tokens. Um, and I think in the Polkadot ecosystem, we we definitely contribute uh, to contributed to that conversation and let it, but I'm not sure that D2O in its current state is a killer DAP, and the this market has uh, really you know had a, gave us the opportunity to think about how can we extend expand our, our our roadmap to introduce a killer DAP, and when we think about Polkadot, how can our project be something that somebody who is in another ecosystem says all right. I want to go over to the Polkadot ecosystem to use that. That's a cool project. I'm, I right. want to go invest in that and, and be a mechanism to help onboard folks to the Polkadot ecosystem because we've got the rails, we've got the rails to do it. Um, and yes. we feel very confident about what we've developed. And I think now it's really thinking through how can we really expand what we've built to date to really deliver a killer dApp for the ecosystem. All right, Harrison, uh, thanks for coming on with me for this a little bit of a strange format for Space Monkeys here. But it's nice to talk to you after, um, you know, what happened and, and what after what we talked about in the old uh, interview there. And it's nice to get an update and uh, hear your honest reflections on building in this market right now. 
Um, can't wait to, to see you and talk to you again soon and see what this mystery project is. Do you have a code name for this project or what? And, and, uh, internally we do, but I, I don't want to put something out there. Still no. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Okay. Look at this. All right. <laughs> Fine. I've never seen such an iron will. All right. Thanks very much, Harrison. We'll, uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Cool. Thanks a lot, Jay.